Good evening, my name is Jane Francis and I'm Director of the British Antarctic Survey. And tonight I'm going to talk about Antarctica as a continent, which millions of years ago was actually not isolated, but connected to many other continents around the Southern Hemisphere and was covered with lush forests and dinosaurs and was, had a lovely warm climate. But the history of Antarctica after that is that it did become isolated as that icy, cold, but beautiful continent that we know today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ice and what is happening as, as humans, we're warming the climate and how Antarctica is being affected by global warming, but in return, how Antarctica is getting its own back and affecting all of us across the planet. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, a very warm welcome to our fourth lecture in the Darwin College lecture series, um, uh, where, as you know, the subject is isolation. So far, we've spanned Persian poetry, Australian asylum seekers, and quantum physics. But today, we turn to the most isolated continent on Earth, Antarctica. Our speaker is Professor Dame Jane Francis, the director of the British Antarctic Survey. As I'm sure you all know, she's a geologist, in fact, specializing in paleoclimatology and paleobotany, and was previously a professor of paleoclimatology at the University of Leeds, where she's now the chancellor. She was awarded the Polar Medal for Outstanding Contributions to British Polar Research in, 2020, in 2002. Uh, and in 2017, she was appointed a Dame Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George for services to polar science and diplomacy. Uh, she was, in 2021, elected as Fellow of the Royal Society as well. So Jane has worked on the origins of Antarctica, covering the period of time before flowering plants appeared anywhere on Earth, uh, and a place that's currently, of course, frozen with at least five kilometers of ice in some places. She's tracked the evolution of the continent from the point where it was connected to other land masses and was covered with forests, had dinosaurs, but alas, no penguins. Um, the work of Jane and her colleagues has shown that the mass extinction that followed the impact of the large asteroid that hit Earth caused exaggerated trauma on Antarctica uh, which resulted in the extinction of over 80% of the species. That was an era where carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were high, and the sea around the continent was as warm as the Mediterranean is today. What then, we ask ourselves, led to that vibrant continent becoming the largest single mass of ice on Earth? Well, the freeze, according to Jane, is not entirely due to reduced carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Large tectonic movements caused Antarctica to be detached, so ocean currents simply encircled it, adding to its isolation. You will hear much more and much better from Jane. So please join me in welcoming Jane Francis to give her lecture on Antarctica, Isolated Continents. Thank you very much, Master, and um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, the Master already used this word, isolation of Antarctica, so what I'm going to show you, actually, for most of the talk, is that Antarctica wasn't isolated, but it did become isolated, and it's becoming non-isolated now. It's affecting us all. Before I do that, I'm just going to explain why I'm wearing this rather extravagant dress, because this is the Antarctic tartan, so Antarctica has a special tartan, um, specially designed for Antarctica. And I haven't got time to do it, but you can see this white square, which is the continent. There's a cross in the middle, which is the South Pole. There are the orange and yellow and black around the edge, which are the colors of the penguin and the lichens on the continent. There's a pale blue, which is the shallow seas around Antarctica. And there's a dark blue here, which is the deep sea around Antarctica and the polar night, the dark, cold winters. If you would like uh, any <laughs> Antarctic tartan, <laughs> it's, uh, 
It is, you can go online to the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, which is a registered charity that looks after all the old stations in Antarctica and then uh, hosts um, tourists from, from cruise ships into the stations. And they have a website in which you can buy a scarf of the Antarctic uh, tartan. You won't find a dress because this is the only one in the world. But um, <laughs> specially made for me for giving speeches. So Antarctica. This is Antarctica. This is the place I work and I love. And this is the best picture I've got of Antarctica. And it's truly sensational. Um, this is the Antarctic Peninsula. So uh, before we start, I'm going to mention some places. And if you put your left hand up like this, this is, you can see, this is a map of Antarctica. And the, my thumb will therefore be the Antarctic Peninsula that sticks up towards uh, South America. And then this is the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, so my fingers are on the Transantarctic Mountains. And I, I might point to some bits of my hand to show you where um, I'm referring to later in the talk. But on this picture here of the peninsula, you can just see that little area here. You can see there's a line there, which is a runway. This is our sta the main station, the UK main station of Rothera, where we go to. So we fly from South America, or take the ship, and go to Rothera, and then go out into the field from there. So it is a pretty sensational place. And here's another area. This is um, how I've worked in the past using ships in this area, which is really beauty, uh, beautiful and really isolated away from the rest of the world in this really icy climate now. This is a satellite uh, map of Antarctica, which really shows you that it is an ice-covered um, uh, continent and it is isolated currently, and I'll show you that it's isolated in, in this deep, dark ocean. And, and it is covered in places with over four kilometers thick of ice. So why should you care about Antarctica? The reason you should care about Antarctica and what's happening to it at the moment, which is what I'm going to tell you about, is because as warming around the rest of the world, particularly in the mid-latitudes where humans live and generated by humans, is, is affecting Antarctica and the Arctic in the North Pole, and as that ice is beginning to melt, which I will show you, global sea levels are rising. And, and some of that, that rise is caused by contributions from Antarctica. If all the ice on Antarctica melted, which means there would be no ice left in the rest of the world, global sea levels would rise by 50 meters. And you definitely wouldn't be sitting here then. And I would be living somewhere on the Pennines on a high mountain top to avoid being drowned. So this will be a, a real big threat to life as we know it. So what happens in Antarctica affects the rest of us in the, in the whole globe, particularly through global sea level rise. So let's go, as, as the master said, I'm a geologist by training, and I'm going to take you back to a time when Antarctica was not isolated and show you what it was like then. So... For millions of years, Antarctica was connected to continents in the Southern Hemisphere. This, these were all together, called Gondwana. This is a, a paleogeography map that geologists use. They can, we can work out where continents were in the past. So this is the whole globe sort of stretched out. And you can see Antarctica here. It's over the South Pole. So the interesting thing about the Antarctic continent is that it has been over the South Pole for at least 100 million years. And it hasn't moved since then. It's still where it is, the same place now. So when we see changes in the climate, they are true climate changes, not because the continent has moved around. So um, there were connections between, there was a connection between uh, South America and Antarctica. And you can see at this time, 100 million years ago, time of the dinosaurs, there was a connection between Australia as well. And at one point before this, South Africa, Africa was attached to Antarctica, so was India. So 100 million years ago, time of the dinosaurs or the Cretaceous, if you're a geologist, India zipping its way across the Indian Ocean is going to hit the Asian block and form the uh, Himalayas a few million years later. Af Africa is moving north, South America is moving north to make that break here, but that's later story and soon and, uh, Australia will break from Antarctica and then really isolate it. 
But 100 million years ago, there, there was a join. And if I was an animal, I could probably walk all the way from South America across Antarctica into Australia and end up in New Guinea. And a lot of the fossils and fossil plants show that connection across the continents. And believe it or not, one of the most common fossils in Antarctica is of fossil plants because um, a lot of the rocks that are exposed are of, of rocks that formed on land, so river deposits or um, land deposits. So although there is not much rock exposed at all, only less than 1%, there are some mountains here. So this is the Transantarctic Mountains. Um, here's the Antarctic Peninsula that points towards South America. And there are some islands around here where all the uh, uh, rocks are exposed. And these are um, of ages where there are lots of fossil plants. So we can see some fantastic leaves like this preserved in the rock record that tell us about climates in the past. So this is the kind of place that I've worked. This is a particular fantastic island called Seymour Island, which doesn't have any ice on it. It's an amazing place. Um, the ice caps have gone. And so what you get is something that looks like the Sahara. So there's my camp over there. And um, before I had too much admin to do, I used to go to Antarctica as a scientist for um, two months, three months, I live in a tent camp with several other people, and we used to work across a rocky sequence like this, collecting fossils and trying to understand what the climate was like millions of years ago. And so plant-wise, we found a really, really good flora. So you can see here, here's just a selection, a small fossil leaf about two centimeters long. You can see very clear venation here. This is a, a, a type of beech that grows in the Southern Hemisphere now, but that did then, Southern Beech. You can see here, I mean, this looks like modern wood, but this is petrified wood, millions of years old, uh, petrified to stone, um, and, and was, represents driftwood that drifted out from uh, the forests into the adjacent seas and has been petrified um, and then was a driftwood, basically. And then we also find uh, some pollen and spores. So these are pollen and spores. They're really microscopic, less than a millimeter. But they are absolutely sensationally preserved and, and easy to get out of the, the rocks that we found there. And those give us a really good feel for the kind of plants that aren't preserved as leaves, leaves or stems or wood, but are preserved as just through their pollen or their spores. And they tell us a lot about the plants which are very delicate or live in the undergrowth that never actually get preserved or petrified. So, for example, here's some sort of on, pressed on rocks. So you can see this beautiful plant here with all the leaves attached. Though there's no cuticle, there's no actual leaf material left, unfortunately. But this is very, this is very, very similar to living tree ferns. If you go to New Zealand or Tasmania, if you go to the western part of Tasmania and you walk through the state forest there, you are essentially walking through ancient Antarctic vegetation. Uh, as long as you uh, ignore any gum trees, any eucalyptus, which are young and uh, invaders, horrible things, but it, all of the other trees, the southern beech, the tree ferns, and other types of conifer were in Antarctica and they're in Tasmania and New Zealand now. So uh, we're all, they were all linked. And this amazing fossil here, so here's a big nodule of rock about 10 centimetres long, and you can see the, uh, the main stem here, and you can see leaves attached. So any of you that's got a monkey puzzle tree in your garden, which was brought over by Victorians from the Southern Hemisphere, it's nothing to do with UK vegetation, except if you go back 150 million years ago. But um, these are intact leaves, and they're really thick and waxy, just like monkey puzzle tree uh, branches today. And, and a monkey puzzle tree, it doesn't shed individual leaves, it sheds the whole branch, and that's what we find here as fossils. And one of the amazing places, most amazing places that I've been in the past is to Chile, up in the high mountains of Chile, Chile where you see these volcanoes, and they have the most amazing natural parks, and one of them is just completely full of monkey puzzle trees and it just looks like something that the dinosaurs should walk through. So Antarctica probably looked like this millions of years ago. So that's just a snapshot of many, many hundreds of different types of fossil plants that we find. 
And this is a summary of it, really. So 100 million years ago, this is the best reconstruction of an Antarctic forest that you'll find. So this is, a, this is put together by um, geologists and a PhD student that worked with me who worked on a, a single layer, a bed of rock. And she measured the location of different tree, petrified tree stumps and the petrified roots and leaves of in situ uh, fossils. They were preserved in the place that they grew. So she mapped them all out. And then we worked with an artist called Bob Nichols, who's a dinosaur expert and we put together this forest. So basically, he has extracted from our head this forest that we imagined in Antarctica based on scientific information. So you can see here is a land with volcanoes, and in this dense forest, you've got this tree here. So this is, you can, may recognize ginkgo leaves, maiden hair uh, tree. That's another one there. That's, they're quite common in the fossils. This is the southern hemisphere uh, conifer called a podocarp. So we have the leaves and the wood of podocarp trees. Here's the monkey puzzle trees again. Some um, tree ferns here. Some plants which were in the undergrowth and very common which are extinct. So this is a reconstruction based on the fossils. Um, some normal ferns and a few bri uh, bryzo and a few lichens. There are no flowering plants in Antarctica 100 million years ago. They hadn't yet um, reached Antarctica. They're only just evolving in other parts of the globe. <clears throat> so when I was working on this with uh, Bob, drawing this, and he said, well, where, where are the animals in this? And we haven't found any bones particularly here. We found them up here in the north. And so I said, well, could you just put a couple of eyes poking out of the undergrowth <laughs> just to encourage students to go and look for the bones in the future? And when this, this pic, the, orig the original uh, picture is in the British Antarctic Survey up on, uh, in, on, the Madding on our Maddingley site, um, and... Um, it's in, it's in a geology display, and there were no eyes in it, and I was very disappointed, so I said, well, where, where's the animals, Rob? And he said, I have put you an animal in there. It's there, but it's hidden. It's for you to find it. So can you see it? It's well hidden. There it is. Look, there. <laughs> so he, he, he really hid that work. So this is a small dinosaur. It's a herbivorous vegetarian dinosaur, probably about... Um, probably about three meters long, and uh, they were quite common in Australia and, and around Gondwana, so these were animals that were probably moving in herds around Gondwana. And the interesting thing is, so I think we painted this in about 2000. In 1989, a very long time ago, my first trip to Antarctica was with the British Antarctic Survey, and we found some bones of a dinosaur in loads of tiny little bits. It disintegrated. We collected them and from way, way up here, and they were sitting in the Natural History Museum, and they've been reconstructed, and we know all about the dinosaur that we found in 1989, and you may see it on a Channel 5 TV program about the Natural History Museum that will come out this spring, and you'll see exactly what that dinosaur is, that we got it right when we reconstructed it, and you'll see a lot more about the anatomy and the fact that it's got a brain the size of a cat. Um, and so it was a very interesting dinosaur. So watch that space. <clears throat> Later on, after about 100 million years, probably about 70 million years ago, which isn't very long geologically speaking, we had flowering plants appear in Antarctica. And they're the classic flowering plants that you see in the southern hemisphere. A lot of these big waxy things that you see in bunches of flowers in Waitrose and Marks and Spencers at the moment. And they're the uh, Proteaceae. So these big, sort of big globes of waxy flowers, they grew in Antarctica. And we know about this both through some f f uh, leaves and flowers, but also from the pollen. So this is a tiny pollen grain that's less than a millimeter, but we know this is from Proteaceae, fossil one, and it probably formed from a plant like this and tree ferns, and we have the po very distinctive pollen from tree ferns fossilized. So what we can, can see quite easily is that many of the Antarctic plants are the ancestors of the mod mod modern southern, he southern hemisphere vegetation, which is very, very different from the northern hemisphere vegetation, except where traveling Victorian botanists have mixed them all up. But it's a very different kind of vegetation which has evolved on separate continental blocks. So we've got here 
uh, this very famous leaf, and this is modern Nothophagus or southern beech, which grows in Patagonia, in, in New Zealand, Tasmania, Australia. Um, the Proteaceae, Proteaceae leaf, and Embosphorium grows in Chile. And then we have this kite-shaped leaf of Brachychiton-like plants that lived in Australia now. So southern hemisphere vegetation we find as fossils, and we can find very similar modern equivalents today. So this is another reconstruction of Antarctica 70 million years ago by another, another artist, James Mackay, and this is, brings in the flowering plants. So you can see here, here's the, uh, the, the Araucaria, the um, monkey puzzles up in the high mountains like I showed you in Chile. These are all uh, southern beach here in the lowland. They were very, very common. And then you can see also uh, lots of dinosaurs. So my American and Argentine colleagues work on the dinosaurs. So we have a really good fauna of um, dinosaurs. So the hadrosaurs, where else have we got? Kind of T-Rex. We've got, we've got bird fossils, duck fossils. So we have a duck in the Cretaceous. And we have sauropods and their big footprints. Um, and we have bird, uh, the avian dinosaurs as well. So there's, there's a really good dinosaur um, fauna about 70 million years ago before the extinction of the dinosaurs. And also on here, you can see some red because we now have flowers in our reconstruction. We have flowers, we have water plants, kind of water lilies. Up in the highlands, we've got kind of heath, um, uh, uh, heather type plants up here as well. So flowers were in Antarctica by that time. Just, um, just to move offshore, in the seas, we also have fossils that were living in the seas, just in case you like other things. So here are fossil bivalves. So these are like clams and lots of ammonites, these curly things here, which were um, the shells of squid-like creatures. Very common in the Jurassic coast of the UK, if you ever go down to Dorset. But we have them in Antarctica, and they tell us a lot about um, the conditions in the ocean and the, um, the age of the rocks. And these beautiful shells here of sort of gastropods or snails of types, and you can see the original shelly material still on there. And we can use this shelly material and, and um, look at the isotopic composition of it, look at the chemical composition of the shelly material, and it can tell us about the temperature of the water in which they live. So this is about 70 million years ago, and the temperature of the ocean water then, even on high latitudes, was about 15 degrees centigrade. So warm waters around Antarctica, and definitely no signs of isolation at that time. And again, here's, here's Bob's work. So it, here's the forest on sort of Andean-like Antarctic Peninsula. We had high mountains with uh, volcanoes. And then here's the dinosaur. Look, he's put it, the dinosaur was dyed and has floated out as a bloating carcass, which is being attacked by a primitive shark. Here's a plesiosaur, ples pliosaur, and this huge thing here, which is the size of a double-decker bus, is a mosasaur um, eating a shark. Here's the ammonites, um, squid-like things, fish, birds, and then there'll be lots of shelly materials in the bottom of the ocean. So really full of life 70 million years ago and, and a, a, a really fertile sea and a warm sea too. Now if we go, as, as Master said, the dinosaurs died out. In Antarctica, it was a long way from a meteor, and I think probably some of the volcanoes that were exploding in um, uh, India may have ca caused more trouble in Antarctica. But this is Antarctica 50 million years ago, reconstructed by American colleagues. So by 50 million years ago, the dinosaurs had disappeared from the landscape, the ammonites had disappeared from the oceans. But what you can see is that the plants carried on. There was very little impact, long-term impact in the vegetation in Antarctica from any kind of event or mass extinction that happened at the end of the Cretaceous. So you can, oh, so you can see here um, Southern Beach, again, continued in Antarctica as if nothing had happened. Monkey puzzle is very common still. We have some flowers. Winter AC, um, mountain pepper bushes grow in Tasmania today, grow in Patagonia today. They were in Antarctica. Um, lots of mosses, no grass, but lots of mosses and lichens. 
And then we have possums, so we start having marsupials. The mammals were there before the dinosaurs died out, but they certainly took into the trees um, when they're gone. We have rheas, or these carnivorous, huge carnivorous birds that um, roam the southern hemisphere. And we have these, uh, they're called gondwanotheres, but they're kind of primitive ungulates, or I like to think of them as primitive llamas or guanacos that lived in Antarctica at that time. And you mentioned, like, no penguins, but you see these little black dots on the beach. These are penguins. So penguins evolved when Antarctica was warm. And in the same layers of rock that we see all of these plant fossils that indicate warm climates, we also find fossils of many species of penguins. So penguins evolved in the warm geological past, and only a couple of them remained in Antarctica when it got cold. The rest of them went to, um, they went to South Africa, they went to the Falklands, they went to southern um, Australia, and just a couple, the emperor penguins and the Delhi penguins, stayed behind. So penguins are, are really like the warmth, really. So what happened then after this warmth, and what happened to, to really kill the warmth? Well, a lot of my geological colleagues who do modeling of climate change, they show that about, uh, <clears throat> after about 40, 50, 40 million years ago, the, carbon, the natural levels of carbon dioxide started to drop, and so the Earth cooled naturally over quite some time, so a, a, a slow process, just through the natural processes of Earth evolution, natural processes of, te of the rocks taking in carbon dioxide, burying it, and, and taking it out of the system. So the Earth was beginning to naturally cool. But then what happened was that there were tectonic plate movements, and you can see that Australia, by about 40 million years ago, Australia is well separated from Antarctica, uh, South Africa is way, way gone. And the most important tectonic event was the break between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. And there's a tectonic plate that goes down here, and it sort of broke across here. It's a huge curve across here of the tectonic plate. And for the first time, this allowed a current, an ocean current, to flow around Antarctica. What happened before, it just went from the equator all the way down and brought warmth to Antarctica and was deflected back. But for the first time, the current, the circumantarctic current, was able to um, flow continuously around Antarctica, and it trapped Antarctica in its icy tomb. And that's when the really big ice sheets on Antarctica started to form. And if we look at some of the rocks of that age in Antarctica, we start to see evidence of ice in the form of glacial, glacial rocks, glacial tillites. And so, until a few years ago, um, people thought that once that happened and Antarctica was cold and, and we see evidence of ice, there were no more plants. But actually, you just have to go and explore Antarctica a little bit more. And so, some colleagues and I went to this place called um, the Beardmore Glacier, which is very famous because that's where Scott and Shackleton went up. They went up this way to, to the South Pole, where Amundsen had been before. And on the way back, they collected fossil plants from the other side of the, of the glacier over here. And the, and the, the plants they uh, collected, they were about um, 200 million years old, quite old plants, now extinct. And they took them all the way back to the bottom of the glacier, where the famous story is where Scott and his companions died uh, in their tent, but they left a, a box of fossil plants next to the, the tent. So they were very famous. If only they had gone the other side of this glacier to this place here, they would have found these kind of leaves. And do you recognize this? This is Southern Beach. And so these were small beech leaves that lived here a few million years ago. So forests were still in Antarctica, even though the ice set in. And we know that because so this is looking at, this is the side of the glacier where, I, where the picture I took was. And this is, uh, these are a series of rocks which are glacial tillites. They were formed by um, a glacier that flowed across here about 10 million years ago. 
It's only 300 miles, 800 kilometers from the South Pole, so we're really close to the South Pole now, about as close as you can get on any rock to the South Pole. And these contain evidence that there were glaciers that once flowed across this particular area about, say, five to 10 million years ago. Very hard to date. And what do we find in them? So we find these tiny, tiny little twigs here. So here am I holding this. So this is about the thickness of your uh, little finger. And actually, if you chop that open, you can see hundreds of tree rings, annual tree rings. So these are tiny, tiny little shrubs that um, grew very slowly, sandwiched between these glacial rocks. So they were kind of small uh, shrubs were growing on a tundra-like environment uh, in very, very cold conditions with just enough warmth to allow these small trees to grow. And in some of the layers, you can see all the brown here of these uh, twigs, but in some of the layers, you can also see Guess what? You can see Nothophagus, southern beech here. So there are sheets of these southern beech leaves along with these twigs. So what we've got here, even though there were glaciers in the area, there were still the last remnants of vegetation. Now by that time, Antarctica was isolated. So what we see here is the end of the vegetation that was completely isolated from the rest of the world by this big current flowing around Antarctica. And its fate was sealed, in a way. And as the climate cooled, eventually uh, these forests w became extinct. So these are the last tiny forests in Antarctica. And they probably look like this. This is actually one of the fossils from that sequence. So this is about, uh, about 20 centimeters. It's a really lightweight. If I gave it to you, you'd think I'd given you a piece of peat. It's a lightweight, uh, mummified bush of a kind of... Um, a, a cushion plant, and these are cushion plants here that live today on the top of uh, Mount Field in Tasmania, so in high altitude, cold conditions, you had these plants that live up there. So this is probably what Antarctica looked like near the South Pole. These are, these are also small podocarp conifers and some southern beech here as well. This is probably what Antarctica looked like near the South Pole about five to ten million years ago when it was isolated from the rest of the world and very cold. And I'll just show you one more thing. So this is um, a colleague of mine who worked, we worked up there, Alan Ashworth from Dakota. He's a paleontologist and who likes to use bees and brooms to collect his fossils. So there was a layer along here, which was a, a small lake deposit, a fossil lake deposit, amongst all this glacial debris. So there was a small lake near glaciers about five to 10 million years ago. And Alan collected bags and bags and bags of this sediment because he looks for fossil insects, which are tiny, tiny fragments, little black things. And back in his lab, he found these things from those bags. He found this thing here, which is, a, he reckoned, because he's an expert, I didn't recognize this, but he recognized the snout of a weevil he recognized the carapace, the back here, of a weevil, and then the leg of a weevil. And this is what he found, but this is a modern one. This is a Magellanic weevil from Chile, and he found the fossil equivalent of it in, in Antarctica, five to 10 million years ago, in these last forests. There are hardly any insects in Antarctica at the, mo at the moment now. There's just a couple of small mites and springtails but these were the last insects in Antarctica. So it was an incredible find. So s s carbon dioxide levels continued to fall, um, and gradually the ice sheets in Antarctica covered the whole continent. They went beyond the edge of the land. They went out onto the shelf, and we had massive ice ages in Antarctica. And the, then the whole Earth, the whole planet cooled, up to that point, there was just ice in Antarctica, but the whole planet then cooled and ice started forming in the Arctic. The Arctic ice is very young, and that's why we, we really have to be careful because the ice is young and it's likely to go fast as well. But um, this is what probably what Antarctica looked like uh, five to 10 million years ago, completely ice-covered planet. 
So here we are. So here's another view that, that I started with. That other photo was taken over here. And this is Rother R station here. You can see the runway here and some of the buildings where we go to from, from Chile, fly into here, and then hop out over here to do our field work. And one of the things that we do in Antarctica, we, Antar uh, British Antarctic Survey and other polar scientists in the UK, is to study the ocean around Antarctica. And so now this is now, if you like, modern science. I'm not a geologist anymore. I'm talking about the work that my colleagues do in Bass, which is looking at Antarctica now and how the climate is affecting the current Antarctic landscape. So this is a famous ship. This is not Boaty McBoatface. This is Sir David Attenborough. Boaty McBoatface is an autonomous vehicle, a small glider that goes under the oceans, and it lives in Southampton, not Cambridge. And um, so this is the Sir David Attenborough, which is the most amazing icebreaker and science ship, and is currently in Antarctica right now, testing some of the science equipment that's on there to do some really big projects next year. And the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, it is a nightmare to sail across. I am not a good sailor, and for many years I had to sail for three days backwards and forwards across this, this passage of water between um, South America or the Falklands and Antarctica to get to, where I, to get to Seymour Island. And I never stood up hardly any of the way because I was so seasick. But this is why, because it's really rough uh, waters. There's nothing to break up the current but it's a really, really important ocean for particularly in the context of modern climate change. So there's an IPCC um, book about the cryosphere and about this ocean particularly. And the really important thing is that here's, here's a map showing Antarctica in, in the center. It's a really critical point of this global current that drives all ocean currents. So water from here is it's cold, it's salty, and it, it's dense, and it floats from the edge of Antarctica. And you can see this blue line. It sinks down into the deep ocean, and it flows around the, 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 the deep, deep ocean. And then it gradually comes up, and it warms as it reaches the surface. But you can see that there, there are interconnecting currents around the whole um, of the ocean, ocean surfaces around the whole planet, which are linked to Antarctica. So it plays a critical part in global ocean circulation. And this is the current around Antarctica, the circumantarctic current, which you can see isn't just a sort of a, a single current. It's actually a lot of small eddies. There's lots of small whirlpools in this current, as you can see here. And they're really important because they help draw down heat and carbon dioxide into the deep ocean. And the, the Southern Ocean is so extensive and so deep that it actually takes in a lot of heat and it takes in a lot of carbon dioxide. So it's been estimated that it sort of takes in the equivalent of 36 degrees of heat generated by anthropogenic warming um, into the ocean structures. And it also um, absorbs half of the carbon dioxide that is drawn down into the world's oceans. So at the moment, it's doing us a big favor. And we really need to understand a bit more about where the heat and the carbon dioxide is going and sort of what will happen to it in future. So this is the real focus of a lot of modern ocean science. But um, <clears throat> a lot of the big um, questions in... Antarctic science at the moment is about what is happening to the ice, in particular what is happening to the ice at the edge of the continent, on these, particularly these areas called ice shelves. So it's a bit fuzzy, but satellites are showing. So the satellites are brilliant for Antarctica because they show the whole um, picture. But you can see here the red areas show where the ice is thinning. And you can see, particularly here, the, the Antarctic Peninsula is, is red. There's a lot of red here. This is where the ice is thinning. And if I showed you the ocean around it, you'd also see that the ocean was warm there. There's also some areas around here, East Antarctica, where there's uh, some thinning ice. But actually, the most of Antarctica is this huge ice sheet of the East Antarctic um, ice sheet. 
and I love this picture. So this is a NASA satellite image which has been colored to show, if you like, uh, the different types of ice and the speed of the ice. And you can see these tree-like structures are the ice streams that are streaming down off of Antarctica. It's all false color, but it stands out well. But have a look at these, these purple, red, pink, purple areas. These are ice shelves. So as the ice streams off the land in Antarctica, as glaciers, ice streams, it then floats on the, on the ocean as ice sh shelves. And they form a really important part of Antarctica's glacial story because you can see oh, there are very big shelves here and they're buttressing the, um, the glaciers on land. So they're holding back the glaciers on land. And they're really like the doorsteps. And the, wor the worry is that if these melt, then all of these glaciers that are flowing on land will then flow into the ocean and melt very quickly. And it's this ice on land which is the new contribution to global sea level. So what we, what we really are studying at the moment is the stability of these ice shelves to see whether they're going to melt soon because then they'll let loose all of these glaciers and that will contribute to global sea level rise. This particular area here, you can see there's a very modest ice shelf, but there's a star there because this is very important. And this is where there's a very famous glacier called the Thwaites Glacier, which if you read a lot of the BBC Science website, you will have seen reports on that. Because this sort of part here, if you like, your thumb of your map of Antarctica, is called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. So that's the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. And there's another one here, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And a lot of it here in the middle is not sitting on rock at all. It's actually the ice is below sea level. And the worry is that if warm water gets underneath here and, and then melts out this area here, this whole ice sheet may disintegrate and that's several meters of global sea level rise relatively quickly. And let's, uh, let's go on. So there's this big project that um, is ongoing. Um, and uh, there's some people, TJ in the audience has just come back. He didn't manage to get there because of the, uh, the COVID and all sorts of weather problems. But there were people still working on the Swates Glacier. So there, this is a multi-million pound project with a, a joint project with um, NSF and with, between NERC, NERC. And so you, there was the ship projects that are launching these ocean uh, instruments to measure the temperature of the ocean. There are people who are camping on the ice shelf and drilling through the ice shelf to understand what's going on there. There are people working on the rocks at the side to understand where the ice came up to in the past or the age of the ice. There are satellites and there are uh, twin otters measuring different features of the glaciers. The, real, the really big question is, is ocean, warmer ocean water getting underneath these ice shelves and melting them from below. And what we know is that ocean, um, global warming is affecting, if you like, the lower latitude ocean conditions. That's affecting the winds. The winds are strengthening around Antarctica, particularly on this eastern, uh, western side. And those winds are blowing warmer water from the ocean up underneath the ice. So we know now, because of the observations, that some of this is getting quite warm and melting. And the really critical uh, issue is this place here called the grounding line, the grounding zone. And if warm water gets in here, it unfreezes. The, um, you can see the ice sheet from the rock where it's frozen. And if it does that, then the ice sheet will float and warm water will then be able to go right in down underneath the ice sheet, right into the middle of the West Antarctic ice sheet, and melt the heart out of the West Antarctic ice sheet and cause global sea level rise. So this is what this project is looking for. So this is um, part of uh, the, some of the field work that was done a, a year or two ago. And you can see here the teams here are using one of these things. This is a, a robotic apparatus, which we use a lot now. This one is called IceFin, and it's got instruments on it and cameras. And you have to drill a hole through the ice with hot water, so it's a quite an, an effort. You have to, to take a lot of fuel down. You melt the ice or melt snow around. You drill a hole in the ice with a continuous stream of hot water. And then they're launching IceFin 
down through a hole to go underneath the ice, like here. So this is a fairly new technology. Years ago, we used to put um, robotics uh, like this down, and then we, we used to lose them. They never used to come back out. But um, now we don't do that anymore, which is thankful. <laughs> and, but th so there's a little bit of um, movie here, which is quite new. And this is, let's see, here we go. This is what the what ice fin is seeing underneath. Now, this doesn't look terribly impressive, does it? But this is the first time we've ever seen what a grounding line looks like, or close to a grounding line. So there's the bottom of the glacier, and we're just a few meters above the seabed, so that we can't risk taking ice fin any further because we got stuck. So this is the sea floor underneath the ice. And this here also, let's go back a bit, I'll do it again. There's anemones that are living 50 kilometers from the edge of the open ocean. So this, uh, the grounding line is about 50 kilometers or so from the edge of the Thwaites Glacier to this grounding line. And yet there are animals that are living there in the dark in, in this icy area. It's quite remarkable, never been seen um, in this region before. So they're phenomenal new discoveries, and if you're interested in that, the first main scientific papers of the Swates project are being published next week, and I think there'll be quite a lot of press about them and the new results about how they're melting the ice below the Swates Glacier. The other um, thing which a lot of scientists are looking at now, and this is a big project that's ongoing with multi-nations in the center of Antarctica, is to look at the current ice sheets and look at the history of the ice sheets to see what they tell us about the, the, the history of glaciers and the, um, uh, the climate change. So here's one of my colleagues. He's drilling an ice core, so they build themselves a little tent. The, the, here's the ice core. It goes down, into, down here to drill an ice core, and you can see part of the ice core here. They chop it up into meter lengths, put it in these big boxes, and bring them back to the laboratories to then do detailed work on. And so this is a thin slice of one of those ice cores. And you can see it's got these tiny little bubbles in it. So these little bubbles contain air that was trapped in the snow, which then hardened to ice hundreds of thousands of years ago. And that's the, really the only source of ancient air in the world. It's not a proxy. This is a real air from hundreds and thousands of years ago trapped in ice. So the ice core scientists, they can release the air here, and they can make measurements of both the, the water in the ice and the air in the bubbles, and they can work out the composition of the atmosphere hundreds of thousands of years ago. And there are big projects that have gone back 800,000 years of ice layers. And the, the, the main result that they found is that for the past 800,000 years, when there's been ice on Earth, Atmospheric two was never higher than about 300 parts per million, and now we're at, today, today I checked, we're at 420 parts per million. So on a graph, so you can see here, here's today, let's go back 800,000 years. There's a big project called Oldest Ice right now uh, in, um, in Antarctica that they, and they're trying to drill back to um, one and a half million years to get the, a longer climate record. But you can see what they've got here. They've got a, um, a graph here of Antarctic temperature. So it's going warmer, cooler, warmer, cool, cooler as you go through ice ages, waxing and waning and into glacials. And you can see corresponding carbon dioxide that matches the temperature curve. So the atmospheric carbon dioxide. The main thing to understand is that if you look from, from zero, well, not today, but back to about 1780, go to 800,000 years, the carbon dioxide level never rose above 300 parts a million. This is where we are today. We're way, way, way above the stability of carbon dioxide in an icy world. This graph is very famous, and it has influenced um, politicians and ministers who've looked at it. <clears throat> They've suddenly understood that we are in an unstable world where carbon dioxide levels are way, way above where the ice has existed in the past 800,000 years. And so this is why this is really important to understand ice history and really quite scary about where we're going in the future. 
So what we need to do is both stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere, but if we want to stay in the same kind of world that we see now, we need to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere as well. Now, I haven't mentioned much about the animals, but um, there's a, quite a rich life on, on, on the land and in the oceans, particularly krill. That's the centre of fishing industries around Antarctica, and they feel, feed the whales, which are recovering the albatross, which we are monitoring for bird flu and hope they don't get them, and the seals, the penguins, and, and a whole rich uh, biota in the oceans. And the big question for this is what is happening to these animals? A lot of them are very um, adapted to very low temperatures and a very narrow range of tolerance. And some experiments that we've done with them show that if you warm the water up, they don't really like it and it actually kills them. So this uh, polar uh, um, pyota is really at risk, especially the ocean ones. So um, in, the, in the paper that I wrote in the book, so that was about isolation. In the paper that I wrote in the book, I mentioned very, very end, because everybody thought I was going to talk about isolation of people in Antarctica, didn't you? And so I will mention a little bit at the end, so I can show you a picture of Halley. This is Halley Station. This is our most remote station, which is way, way over here. And it's on a, a, a floating ice shelf, which has just cracked in half. You may have seen that in the news. And um, Several years ago, we moved this station. We took the modules apart and moved it onto the safer side of the crack. So. I, I can tell you the, the um, station is not on a floating iceberg today. The iceberg is floating away from here, but it's, it doesn't have the station on it. But this is a really isolated um, uh, uh, station. Uh, it's just on a, a really white plain. There's no mountains within view. There's not much to do for exercise except walk round and round the station, go to the ice cliffs and see some emperor penguins, which is very nice. This is the place where the ozone hole was discovered in 1985. Um, and there, we do have people there in the summer. We used to have people there all year round. And in the old days, people used to go there for two years at a time and were truly isolated, even when they go there, go there and stay there in winter. In winter, there are no ships around, there are no aircraft around. And if anybody became ill, it's really, really, really difficult and risky to rescue them. And I can tell you that from experience. Um, so this is real isolation, if you like. But there are still about 20 people there. They're always in touch with each other. It's very hard to be alone in Antarctica if, and stay safe. But this is where NASA and ESA have chosen, or other stations in Antarctica as well, to really test out what life is like on Mars or could be like in Mars or going to a space station as far as Mars. And so some of the people in our station have been guinea pigs, if you like, and they have been asked to keep testing their skills of docking the uh, space station into satellites into space station um, to see whether they can maintain their, their skills over long periods of, of isolation where they can't interact and be trained. So there's, it is a bit like space here, and it is very isolated. But of course, nowhere is a scientist really isolated in Antarctica because we have good radio links, we have satellite links. And I, if I wanted to, I could go back into my office, I could pick the phone up, and I could phone somebody in the station there just on a, on a kind of landline with satellite link. So it's very hard to be isolated in Antarctica now, even as a person. So I just want to finish with um, a summary of the kind of importance of Antarctica, what BAS does in Antarctica, and it's an unashamed um, advert advertisement for the British Antarctic Survey.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jane. That was simply magnificent. Um, and now I'm joined by B. Simpson, who's a PhD student at Darwin in the Faculty of Education, to reflect on Jane's wonderful lecture. B. Thank you, Professor Dane, Jane Francis, for introducing us to the subject of Antarctica and the stimulating intellectual puzzle of its isolation and existential effect on the global climate. You have given us an account in which you make a powerful argument that Antarctica may be the most isolated continent with forbidding polar climate and limited human habitation. And yet, despite isolation as we know it today, Antarctica was not always isolated, cold and dry. With evidence of a warmer climate, a different landscape from the one we know today, Antarctica was once a land filled with forests of ginkgo trees, podocarp and conifers, covered in undergrowth um, plants, similar to those growing in regions of Tasmania and New Zealand. A very different world. What happened? Could it happen again? Can we learn anything from these dramatic changes? There are three things that I take away from your talk that might prompt informal discussion after your lecture. One, that Antarctica has not always been isolated. The geological time scale that you've provided gives us a critical puzzle that invites us to further contemplate our planet and its continents and to understand our geological and historical transformation. Two, a first order effect of the changes to the Antarctic climate is the, continent transform, is the continent's transformed landscape, a crucial second order effect is to prompt us to ponder and to interrogate the evidence of historical climate changes and to understand the causes, the influences and effects of such a drastic climatic change upon human existence. And three, our rapid changing climate caused by anthropogenic warming um, may bring nonlinear changes of such a scale and complexity to qualify and perhaps to end Antarctica's isolation. How might we in this audience begin to contemplate, to measure and to mitigate the effects of such a change? So for what you have told us, for the absolutely riveting discussion, thank you and for the conversation that you've prompted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, B. Um, do remember that if you want to know more um, uh, and read again uh, the wonderful story that Jane and our lecturers so far have told, you can already buy the book. <laughs> uh, it's for sale at the back um, on your way out or indeed on Amazon, but it's much cheaper here. So do do that. Likewise, um, if you want to support the work of the British Antarctic Survey, remember you can buy some very fine tartan online, as we've seen, but, but not the dress, sadly. We are now halfway through this extraordinary series on isolation. Do join us again next week uh, when we have Philip Jones, the professor of, a professor of physics at University College London, who is going to focus on the isolation of particles. But please, once more, join me in just saying a very, very big thank you uh, to David.